Good afternoon and welcome to the Alex webinar on PDA, PDA, PDA metrics. Stop worrying and trust your users. I'm Allison Armstrong, a member of the Alex Continuing Education Committee, and I will be your host for this afternoon's webinar. Our presenters today are Jason Dooland, the Assistant Librarian at the University of Arizona, Andrew C., the Head of User Services at Northern Arizona University, and Teresa Hazen, the Acting Department Head for Technical Services and Resource Sharing at the University of Arizona. Let's see. A few things to keep in mind for today's presentation. Today's webinar does not have interactive ch chat capabilities. If you wish to comment on today's presentation using Twitter, you may use the hashtag you see on the screen or earlier. We will not be monitoring the Twitter feed, however. If you have questions, please type them in the questions box, and our presenters will answer them as time permits at the end of their presentation. Questions which remain unanswered while we are on the air will be answered offline and the answers sent to all attendees. This webinar is being recorded, and you will receive an email with links to the recording, the presentation slides, and an evaluation within two days. Please take time to fill out the evaluation form since it will be used by the committee to plan future events. There may be a slight delay as I turn the presentation over to Andrew. Can you all see my screen? Very well. Thank you, everyone, for your attendance today, and we're really happy to be presenting to you. I, along with my colleagues, are going to be talking about PDA metrics at the University of Arizona Libraries and why we learn to stop worrying and trust our users. So, just to give you a little bit of information about myself and who I am, who is this guy? So I'm Andrew C. Uh, as Allison mentioned, I'm the head of user services at Northern Arizona University Klein Library. And you may be wondering, why is some guy from NAU talking about the UA Libraries PDA program? Well, I was formerly at the University of Arizona Libraries, and I was a former uh, UA Libraries acquisition manager, which gave me the prime opportunity to be part of the UA Libraries PDA metrics group, which I'm going to go into in my presentation. I'm also a co-author with uh, Jason, who's presenting today, on an article called Patron Driven Acquisitions, Determining the Metrics for Success, in which the UA Libraries created a group of metrics that allowed us to measure the overall effectiveness of our PDA program. So with all that combined, that's the big package of who I am and why I'm here talking to you today. So when you're talking about PDA and why libraries might want to start doing a PDA program, or more importantly, why they may want to go all in on their PDA program, like the UA libraries did, there's a couple of factors or forces for change which may guide your decision-making process. First, we, we look at the declining budget that all libraries, uniform across academic libraries, special libraries, special collections, public libraries, all are facing declining budgets, and that seems to be par for the course in the history of libraries. Uh, we want to make sure that we are able to purchase materials on smaller budgets, and that budget gets smaller and smaller every year. Um, because of that, we want to make sure that the, the items and books and videos that we do purchase are valued by our customers, and then we see a return on that investment. So we want to make sure that when we, we purchase books, they're actually used because we have less money to purchase. We are able, not as able to purchase as many books, so the books we do purchase need to be used by use, our users. That gets us into a collection that's really user-focused. So when you're thinking about Truswell's 80-20 rule or the long tail, which all of us librarians are, our acquisitions managers are, are used to hearing about, you know, really 20% of our collection is used by the majority of people, and then you have this kind of long tail of, of books and resources that go either go untouched or maybe get used once in a blue moon. We want to make sure that we're focusing our attention to what our users are looking for, and PDA gives us a huge opportunity to use a, utilize that strategy. In, in reality, when you're thinking about roles of librarians, traditional versus roles in looking into the future, you know, that, that changes. A lot of like the, the librarian roles or the, the subject selectors of the past 
you know, we're not staffed as well. We don't have the budget to staff as many librarians. And those librarians that we do staff are doing other things, are doing, are handling multiple tasks. At the UA libraries, there's a big liaisonship uh, program with the librarians where they're out in the academic community. They're working with their respective colleges and departments and, and, and being embedded in those colleges which gives them less time to focus on collection building and looking at sheets of books that they could possibly order. So we need all of these factors drive us into a PDA program. Uh, at the U of A libraries, which I'm gonna get into here, uh, we call it ODID. Of course, every library term has to have an acronym that means nothing to anybody else but us. So ODID actually stands for On-Demand Information Delivery and it gets at PDA and, and it focuses on all of these factors and, uh, and it focuses on declining budgets and that we are allowed to make purchases based on demand as opposed to just in case models. We see a return on investment. It is user focused because our users are actually driving our collection and it allows freeze librarians up to go out into the academic community as opposed to being subject selectors. So how does PDA work at the UBA? Uh, the ODID pro project began in the summer of 2011, and what was unique about it at the time, um, and in many regards still is, is that the ODID program acts as the main driver of our collection. So um, we basically took our hands off for the most part and said, our users are going to develop our collection. And in doing so, we added uh, more than 142,000 discoverable titles into our web OPAC. How it works is that in print, there are actually embedded order links in our web OPAC. So users search our OPAC and either find a book that we have in our library or they find an order link. When they select that order link, uh, they'll be authenticated based on their university status and then we'll actually order the book. It'll come to the library and put on hold for them um, within a certain set amount of time. And Teresa is actually going to go into this in, in her demonstration. Um, electronic PDA, which I think most people are more used to, um, is really seamless to the user. So these are PDA ebooks that are embedded into our, into our catalog from our vendor, and after a set number of unique visits by users, um, we purchase the book. So we have a lot of value in here in that we're not purchasing things until our users tell us to buy them. And additionally, with the with the ebook uh, platform, it's it's vastly more beneficial in that we actually get a certain number of uses before we even decide we need to buy it. So they're almost pre vetted that they're going to be used uh, before we have to before we're on the hook for buying it. So we get a lot more bang for our buck. Um, what I'd like to do now is launch a poll and hear from you guys uh, to know. What you know? What are your biggest fears about going all in with your PDA collection? So, uh, if you take a minute here and answer, and we'll talk about the results afterwards. And the balance keeps shifting. This is really exciting, folks. <clears throat> we got most people voting in here. Okay. <clears throat> so let's look at the results. Uh, really, by a large margin, the biggest fear that we all have for going all in with our PDA programs is unbalanced purchases. So are our users going to be filling our collection with textbooks and leisure reading and manuals and self-help books? Um, that's a legitimate concern and I think I can address that in the next slide. It looks like there was also a substantive amount of you who are worried about budget and, and really kind of losing control of your collection and not making, having that control to, to make your collection the way you want it to be. So let's talk about, you know, unbalanced purchases. What you can do for PDA, and this is what the U of A did, which was, which was very successful, is to really set yourself up for success. And you can do that by creating a profile with your vendor that basically is going to set you up 
so that the only books that your users are going to potentially purchase are books that you would have ultimately purchased yourself in your previous uh, collection development programs. So at the U of A, uh, our profile with our vendor was that all PDA titles that users had access to, so all of the selection records, were current scholarly materials. We didn't have textbooks as options to purchase. We didn't have popular fiction. Now, granted, we are an academic library, so this, this profile is going to vary depending on your particular library. That may be very different at a public library, for instance. Um, in our case, we, did, we don't focus on popular fiction, and we, don't, we didn't have manuals. So people could not purchase that um, in terms of building collections. So what, again, what they are able to purchase are things that we, in previous models, would have purchased just at, at, off the bat. Now we're letting our users make the decision process, so we know we're going to get use on that. Um, in terms of, so I've got some data here that I wanted to show you, show you guys, and I think this will address some of the concerns about skyrocketing budget and, and losing control of the collection. So what we have here is a pre-PDA year, an example of one year pre-PDA, and compared to post-PDA, so four years, and that's important to consider here. <clears throat> in 2010, for example, we purchased 13, over 13,000 books and at a cost of over a million dollars. So the cost for that of 2010 was over a million dollars. Post-PDA, so once we launched the program from 2011 until now, we purchased only 18,000 books from the PDA selection titles at a cost of just under two million. And really the cost per year is under a half a million. So you've, we, with the, with the post-PDA model, we've dropped our budget annually by over half. And keep in mind, the selections that people were ordering are, so, are, are vetted within our profile, so we're not exploding in things that we normally wouldn't have bought anyway. And what Jason's going to talk about in his presentation later is, is really a, is also a comparison of those titles by um, LC class. You can see that really our users, in large part, were purchasing, you know, thing they were purchasing along the same lines that we were purchasing. There were some unique uh, outliers to that, which I think you'll all find very interesting. But to rest, to lay that fear to rest, I want to let you know that you can build the tools into your infrastructure so you don't have to worry about balanced purchases skyrocketing budget or losing your collection. It's all in how you create your profile with the vendor and then letting your customers, uh, and then trusting in your customers that they're going to purchase what they actually want to use. I should also let you know that the data that I'm supplying here was, was supplied by Steve Bosch, who I'm sure many of you know. He's a rock star in our world. Um, he's the materials budget procurement and licensing librarian at the University of, Li uh, University of Arizona Libraries, and I'm really happy that uh, he was able to supply this information for us. So we launched the program in 2011, and really the goal was for the libraries at that point was to see how can we measure the success of this program. In doing so, they created the ODID metrics project team, which I was a part of, Jason Doolin was a part of. And our charge was to coordinate the design and implementation of the data gathering processes to evaluate the ODID program's effectiveness. Really, the, the deliverables at that point were to assess the quality of resources, the amount of those resources that we actually supplied, the cost effectiveness of the program, and overall customer satisfaction of the program. The, the project team was uh, comprised of a research services librarian, uh, Jason, a library analyst from that department, uh, a library information associate in acquisitions, who was me at the time, um, and really the person who was in charge of managing the, the um, on demand, not on demand, uh, the suggest to purchase things or, or direct orders from subject librarians. Uh, a library information associate in library infrastructure, and, and this gentleman's task was to kind of be input in a stakeholder for how the PDA, the, the physical processing of books and how that works when, when they were delivered to the library. And then, of course, Steve Bosch, who is the materials budget procurement and licensing library. So that kind of whole group comprised this, this team, which was set out to create some metrics to determine how successful the program was. So the metrics that the team eventually came up with after a 
painstaking three month process in which we all got to know each other very well. Uh, we ended up breaking them down into different dimensions uh, that made it a little bit more palatable. Uh, one of those dimensions was the financial, and that those metrics really were focused on the cost per use of the titles, the cost per use by LC class, and these are things that Jason's going to go over today, and the overall total expenditures of the program. The next dimension was our patron dimension, and that really delved into the customer satisfaction, so how people really enjoyed or, or felt that this program was seamless to them and their experience using it. Customer behavior. So what you know? What is the behavior of an undergraduate student in PBA versus a graduate student versus a faculty member, um, and really just their overall experience of that program? And that we actually had a, the, the creation of those metrics was very beneficial in helping us identify some some key uh, pitfalls and barriers in the program itself. Uh, performance metrics were really kind of on the shoulders of the vendor and how well they were holding up their part of the bargain. So they got to the average delivery time of print resources, which we did um, in the creation of these metrics determine was a problem that we were able to address. And also if ebooks were allowing an adequate amount of download options. So people just generally want to download chapters, they want to download uh, content for offline reading, and we wanted to make sure that the resources that we were providing followed along those industry standards. Usage metrics really got to the heart of the circulation of those books. So once the book was here, how many times did it circulate? Uh, well, a lot of data shows that it, you know, if one person checks out a book, statistically, other people will be checking out that book, and that's one of the key um, factors in PDA and why people go go for those types of programs because you get more bang for your buck and you get a bigger return on your investment. The use of eBooks and how the delivery time of print resources affects the usage. So if there was a long turnaround time before when someone ordered it to when it was delivered, did that affect them checking the book out? And lastly, resource metrics, which gets to the understanding of our research, resource pool and how that drives user behavior. So what types of titles do we have in our collection and how are users kind of devouring that, those resources and using them? We wanted to see how many of the resources we provided and how much people actually use them. So in my last data statistic that I provided, you know, there was only 12% of the, of the total resources provided that were discoverable that people actually purchased, so that's huge. You know, that, that kind of gets to the heart of, if we had purchased all of those 142,000 titles, people would have only checked out 12% of them, and that's a, that's a huge thing to consider when you're considering PBA. Um, and also, how currency of the resources affects usage. So, are people only really going after new titles, so do we need to kind of sunset older titles after a period of time? Our current profile sets it so we want, we want titles five years or newer, but even then, are people only selecting the most recent ones? And how long do those PDA titles sit in the web OPAC before we can actually pull them out because we think nobody's going to use them? So I've kind of talked about the background of the program, how we, had it, how we set it up, and also how we determined the metrics to do that. I want to also just quickly mention that if you're interested in finding out more about the metrics and in, in, in vastly more detail how we got to them, uh, Jason and I did co-author a paper uh, called Patron Driven Acquisitions, Determining the Metrics for Success, uh, which I've uh, put a citation here at the bottom of the slide, so if you're interested, have a look at that article. But I'd really like to hand this over to Teresa now to go into the, the nuts and bolts of the program and how it works and how awesome it is. So if you'll allow for just a moment, we're going to hand it over to Teresa. Hi there, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are um, in the country. And so this, my section um, of the program is really going to give sort of methodology and process so that you have context and background information to better understand both our PDA program and what Jason Julin is going to talk about in the next se session, um, particular to the metrics. So I've split my piece into a couple of sections. First, I'm going to do a quick run through of our print um, PDA program, so it's like a snapshot of what we're doing currently um, and focusing on both the user perspective, what's the user experience when they um, interact with the selection records and, and how they actually get the material in, in their hand. Um, and then also from a staff perspective, I noticed that there's several um, people from tech services backgrounds here today, so 
hopefully that will be interesting to you to see how, from a staff perspective, we run the program. And then lastly, I will show um, how I pulled the data from our ILS that Jason then worked with um, to come up with some metrics. So who am I? So my name is Teresa Hazen, and I am the interim head of delivery description and acquisitions at the University of Arizona, and that department, that's quite a mouthful, is um, really head of cataloging, um, acquisitions, um, and resource sharing, and so the interlibrary loan. We also um, are responsible for the care of our discovery tool, which is Summon, and we do some um, information resource management work as well, so quite a bit of work is done in that area. So. Um, what you're looking at on this slide is, um, as Andrew talked about earlier, we have over 140,000 PDA records. This is an example of a print PDA selection record that is in our public catalog. And um, of the print PDA, there's a little over a third um, of, of the actual selection records are print PDA records. And through 2014, from when we started the program, we have, our users have purchased um, a little over 8,700 titles, so that's some information for you. So what you're looking at on the screen is an example of a print PDA record, and what I've highlighted is the link that um, Andrew talked a little bit about earlier. Here's just a, um, a screenshot of that, which of doing a keyword search under social media, the customer or uh, user, you know, see, finds this book and has that link, and they click on that slide. And from there, what they do is they authenticate into you know, our existing institution's authentication system. And um, what actually happens behind the scenes is that um, Coots, which is the, the print PDA vendor we work with, their API will um, gather, um, captures information on the user so that we know when the records come, when the books come, who we need, who we need to match up and place that hold for. So as you can see in this slide, um, down below I just did a small screenshot of what the actual mark record, and so you can see in that 961 field, it's got my name and um, the institution's assigned email address that will allow us to then find that person and manually, unfortunately, these systems don't talk to each other, our, our ILS and, and to but will allow us to manually then um, put that, that on hold for that person so that they get it. So, but from the user perspective, um, after the order is placed, then they get the screen that says that's dynamically created. And it can say some different things. This one says it's currently in stock, estimated delivery time 10 days. There can be an out of stock um, message that comes up that gives a longer um, time that they, you know, estimated time for arrival. I've also seen an a error um, dynamically generated page and asking the user to contact the library. And that's usually when something's already been placed and clicked on and, um, and so they're getting that error message. So in order to cut down on those kinds of error messages, um, we will daily get a file sent from Coot that we then use to go in and change that link so no one else clicks on it. So this is a screenshot of that. So it's, report, it's a report that's generated daily. So um, that's from the staff end so that users don't click on that again. So from the user point of view, success. So um, it takes, like I said, about 10 days, or sometimes it can take less. Um, they get an email that the book has been processed, is on hold to be picked up, and they go to the, the hold shelf, and they get their book and they check it out. So um, this this is usually works really well, and um, we uh, let me let me see. Okay, so so then to move on, some steps in the process um, that for library staff is that you know as I said, the link in the catalog has changed. A mark record file arrives um, with patron information in the local field. I showed you that. But from the staff point of view, there is um, there is some work to be done. So that there's an overlay and creation of an item record and edit of order records. Uh, staff manually places the hold. Um, but in reality, the workflow is actually much uh, more difficult. And I wanted to give you this, this screenshot of internally 
our mapping process. So this is interesting from ordering all the way to cataloging and receiving. Um, what staff, and we do have students that work on, on some of these, uh, do. So, so this is the, the internal process. And one thing that I skipped talking about that I want to call attention to is and this is something for you to consider, is we, we do, when you look at that dynamically um, created page, we do get a fair number of out-of-stock um, uh, requests. And the reason for that is that we started our print PDA program quite a while ago. And we have some aging selection records in our, in our catalog. And it's something that we've been get, beginning to have conversations about of whether we should purge those. So, um, not something for you to consider if you think you might want to purge some of those um, records so that when it's out of stock, it usually takes quite a bit of time. And sometimes that even could mean that it is out of print at the publisher. And then that can take even longer. And then we have to cancel it. And we do an interlibrary loan. So that's something to consider as well. So that's very quickly our print PDA um, process. And um, I just wanted to, to kind of run through that fast for you. So the second part of the presentation is gathering the data. So pulling the data from your ILS for analysis. Um, and so our ILS, we're on a pretty old system, Millennium. I'm sure a number of you are as well, um, perhaps. Um, so you, some of this may be familiar. So we're, we're, using, we're using Millennium. And so within that, we, we, cre we created some lists um, to gather records for exporting and, um, and then exported that out. So the things that you want to start looking at when you want to pull together this data for analysis, um, so these are limiters. Um, in the next few slides, I'm going to talk a lot about um, limiting. So obviously, um, you want to look at monographs that, was, that were purchased within a specific time frame. And we were regardless of format. So we wanted to look at electronic and print. So we wanted to pull things that were um, purchased um, between 2006 and 2009, and then 2010 to 2014 when our PDA program came aboard. So that was one of the things that we, that we used as a data point. The second thing is we had to make some decisions about location. Um, perhaps like many libraries um, out there in your, you know, your institution, we have a lot of affiliate libraries that have um, their metadata in our catalog. So um, the herbarium, the um, Lunar Planetary Lab library um, is, in, is in there. But they're not within our budget. So we definitely wanted to read those, those things out. So for our interest of keeping things somewhat sim simple, we use just our main library, our science and engineering library, and our fine arts library um, for, for the locations. And then the other thing, um, just as an example of some of the things you might want to take into consideration to not include, are things like we get archive loads, which are free, um, but you know, we pay for the metadata. So we didn't want those kinds of things included in there. So that's a consideration for you to take a look at. So more limiters. So, um, uh, more about um, locations and um, monographs. So, you know, you're looking at your material type. You may have some local customization for ebook. We have W, um, and then material type A for for a book, which is a monograph um, that was print. And then with the locations, what you really um, want to consider. I don't know um, about all of you, but our our library chose to create many, many locations at the bibliographic level. And that was problematic for us because um, it means it's not uh, just a building has the bibliographic location. And at the item record level, there's all the, the myriad locations. But we really have a lot of locations at the higher level. So the, our search string is pretty long to um, exclude and include certain locations. So that's something to consider as well. And then I briefly talked a little bit about um, the, the the date ranges and the ways that you would you know, weed out um, things like government document publications, things like that. So creating a print PDA profile, which is what Jason used um, part of his analysis that he's going to show you, 
um, we, we, we created that big list. So we did a lot of work up front on location limiting and, and things like that. And then from there, we could really kind of you know, drill down and get some, some sub lists or, or files that we could then use for different kinds of data gathering. So we, um, creating the print PDA file, we wanted to, you know, a specific date range, but we wanted the presence of an order record that links to the record, meaning that's the, pr that's the purchase PDA. Um, and then we, we have some metadata in a, in a local field indicating that the record um, is used, uh, you know, used to be a selection PDA record. So um, that was an important piece of data that we really needed in order to, to cleanly pull out a file of our purchase PDA print titles. So in creating our export files, um, some of the things to consider is, is you obviously are going to want call number. Uh, you're going to want location and uh, material type so that you can you know, do some analysis um, based on those kinds of data points. And so for the print PDA titles, we also wanted to take a look at total checkouts. And that entailed pulling information from the item record. We also were interested in the price. Um, so we, we got that information from the order record. So a lot of different places that you're going to want to be pulling from to um, get the information that you need for the analysis. So in closing, so we then you know, output our, our file, um, and then Jason took a look at that. And, and then did some analysis on that. And so the things that I want to sort of talk about in closing are a little bit of information about discovery tools and thinking about NGLMS, which your next gen um, catalog, that there will be much better ways to mine data. Um, it's pretty limiting to mine the data using some legacy systems like what we have. So that's, that's something that I think is coming um, that's, that's exciting. And then also, as Andrew sort of alluded to, the state of Arizona over the past decade or more has been less supportive in higher education compared to some other states. I've been here for about two and a half years, and I came from another state which was, was more supportive. So there's been a, a, a gradual decline in state revenues. So as a result, um, UA Libraries has seen many waves of budget reductions, and technical services was hit especially hard several years ago with staff cut to the bare bones. So as a result, we've had to think really creatively about how we acquire and deliver content. So it, this is just a, a really good example that we've been early adopters of some of these, um, these programs that people are now starting to be interested in. Some other things that we, that we were early adopters are outsourcing our cataloging and our heavy book pre-process. So, um, this is, you know, that sort of demonstrates that we have had to push the envelope due to budgetary constraints. And um, so it's, it's a positive move, move for us to go in this direction, as Andrew talked about, but it's not without some cost. Um, it was a bit of a wild west with, um, with the metadata when we first started getting um, PDA programs, big ebook packages, things like that, and third parties creating the meta metadata. So, it's really important to anticipate the future analysis that you're going to need for metrics and what you should include and exclude um, with your metadata. And inclusion is, more, is really important. Um, I've given some examples here of call numbers. Um, we, there was a, a, a short time period before I arrived that call numbers were being deleted from our, our e-books. And because of display issues to the user, it was confusing. But that's really a, a, a very, um, was really not a good thing to do because that's really rich data that you can then use to pull out and get really granular about your analysis of your collection. So um, important. Um, we make extensive use of our local fields um, to identify collections. We work with our vendors to really make sure to, um, to, to have metadata that's going to identify collections so that we can pull them out and then be, you know, and do um, analysis on them. So uh, the bottom line is it's, it's, it's really important when you set up these programs to be very cognizant of what your future needs are and, and, and make sure that you can get that analysis out and getting a really good, but to see if you're getting a good return on your investment. So um, I want to really, you know, kind of warn you of that by, you know, we, we went through that by being very early adopters, so you have some pain 
when it comes to that, but um, overall it's been very positive and just knowing those things in advance um, will really help you to then analyze your collection as you go forward. So that's the end of my presentation. If you want to stand by, we're going to turn it over to Jason, who is going to do a deep dive into the data. So thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Can everyone see my screen? Great. All right, well, my name is Jason Doolin. I'm the business and tech transfer librarian here at the University of Arizona. I was part of the PDA metrics group and a co-author with Andrew on patron-driven acquisitions. Um, today, I'm going to delve into some of the data at a very high level, and we're going to pick apart one uh, Library of Congress uh, one Library of Congress subclass down to the sub-sub level. So a couple things before I start. Once Teresa pulled and ran all the data, I then took those files and uploaded it to what was formerly Google Refine, which is now uh, Open Refine. And from there, I was able to normalize the data, remove all the many errors within the files, so I could examine the, uh, the purchasing behavior both pre and post PDA at the uh, LC sub sub class and uh, just recently I've been able to narrow it down more so I think we're going to be even after this uh, webinar uh, uh, I will be look at this even at a more granular level. Once we uh, refine the data for lack of a better word um, I then took that data and imported it into Access. Once in Access, I ran queries uh, based on the material type, and that's where I uh, got a lot of these numbers. I was also able to sort on the library subclass and sub-sub level. So that's how we handled the data. Um, and I think the big picture about this is, and as we work through this, you will see that the majority of our purchases during this time period came from large package purchases. And the reason we were able to do this as selectors on my team in the research and learning department was because we weren't purchasing books individually anymore. So because of that, we were being able to focus on these large packages and really analyze uh, what was in them and how useful they were to our collections. So let's take a look at the summary of purchases pre-collection. Uh, now we use 2006 to 2009 because during the 2010 period, that first six months, there was it was a transition period, and there was some PDA available, but it wasn't fully implemented. We fully implemented PDA and started purchasing eBooks as our preferred method of purchase on July 1st, 2010. So for the, the pre-data, we looked at two, the four years, 2006 to 2009. In those years, there were over 440,000 what would be considered monographs added during that time period. And um, approximately 110,000 of those were hard copy books. The rest were some e-books, some government documents, pamphlets, and other materials. Uh, we only have LC class, during this time period, we only have LC classification uh, information for hard copy books. The e-books were stripped of this data. The summary of purchases from July 1st, 2010 to June 30th, 2014. PDA only made up a small percentage of our purchase, purchases, roughly 16.7%. PDA resulted in approximately 7,128 hard copy books purchased over this period and just under 65,000 e-books. Um, as a percent, the overall pattern was similar to the pre-PDA program, both in our larger, well, it's with a few notable exceptions um, at the sub-class level, but the PDA looked very similar. 
Uh, as a reminder, the whole, of course, is LC numbers weren't put back into eBooks until 2011. And uh, that's resulted in approximately 26% of all the eBooks since we began PDA were purchased, were, have no LC numbers. And so therefore, at this point, we can't analyze that. The one big difference, as we'll see in a later slide, is P, the languages and literature, where we saw as a percentage of total purchases pre-2006, pre-PDA to post, was a drop-off of 10% of our total purchases. Now, you may think, why would a business librarian care about that? I mean, he can't read, right? But no, it is a big concern because we care about the overall shape of the collection. We want to make sure that we are serving our entire student body and faculty appropriately. So this uh, slide is shamelessly stolen from our poster session from this past summer at the American Library, uh, the annual uh, conference of the ALA. Um, here you can see some of, uh, the, th uh, of the major LC classes. Now the one thing you'll notice is the red, and of course this slide, this type of slide is exactly what you're not supposed to put into a presentation, but we did it anyways. Um, from the red is the 2010 to 2014 print PDA only. The blue is the per, uh, 2010, the post PDA purchases by percentage for the entire collection. And the 2006, 2009 is the pink purchases by percent. So the first, there's a couple things that you'll notice. As I mentioned early, earlier, language and literature used to count for roughly just below 30% of our entire purchases. Post PDA, that number dropped to just under 15% of our total purchases. While the P actual PDA purchases of language and literature was uh, just over 18%. A couple of other things you'll, want, you'll notice here is the non-PDA purchases post-PDA for T, technology, Q for science, rose dramatically. The reason for that is we did large package purchases. And uh, those package purchases were, I want to say, exclusively or almost exclusively in the ebook format. So because we are a science and technology focused university, um, we analyze these collections coming from such sources as Springer, Elsevier, and others, and decided to do major purchases, which allowed us to remove print from our collections and also backfill what we had been missing in these important areas. Um, let me see here. So, uh, but as you can see, there are differences, but um, the one we'll be focusing on today is language and literature. So here we can see the language and literature. Um, one second here, I have to, so, Apologize. We're looking at the comparison by format um, of what was purchased via hard copy 2010 to 2014 via PDA versus ebooks. As you can see, um, we purchased more books uh, in ebook format for language and literature than we did in uh, hard copy form. This is an example of five of the sub subclasses in language and literature. And just going down, PE is English literature, PN is literature in general, PQ is French literature, PR is English literature, and PS is American literature. Uh, so as you can see, uh, this, how the different, the different sub subclasses uh, purchasing behavior based on format. Um, hard, more hard copies were purchased in the English literature and the American literature, while the rest of them, more ebooks were purchased. Okay, 
This is uh, language and literature purchases, um, 2006 versus 2009 versus the PDA. Once again, this is PDA only, uh, 2010 to 2014. And uh, so as you can see, there was significantly about a third, only a third, there was uh, two-thirds less purchases in the PDA of a total number. If we move on, hopefully my, there we go. Um, you can see in the PDA purchases uh, some of the changes. For one, in the red results in less purchases as a percentage of the total purchases in those sub-subclasses. So PG, PJ, uh, PG Slavic languages, PJ um, Far Eastern languages and literatures, PL uh, East Asian and African and Oceania, uh, PL, I'm sorry, PQ <laughs> French literature, and PT the German literature. As you can see, a lot fewer copies uh, of lot fewer purchases of French language and literature um, from 2006 to 2009 as an overall percentage uh, versus the PDA post. So once again, this is post PDA only looking at purchases uh, through the PDA model. Uh, the big winner, I guess you could say, through the PDA model is uh, uh, literature in general and uh, linguistics and uh, English literature. We have a great linguistics department here, so I guess this isn't a surprise. I, I, I heard it was nicknamed MIT West. Um, so it's a very prestigious department and we have quite a few people who come here to study for that. Let's move on, hopefully. There we go. So this now is a slide that shows the non-PDA and the PDA combined. So as you can see, uh, non-PDA accounted for the majority of the purchases, resulting 61,000, just under 62,000 uh, purchases of non-PDA and PDA purchases during the four years, those four years. Um, if we look here, though, if we combine the PDA and uh, non-PDA and compare it to 2006-2009 in the languages and literature, even though as a percentage of our overall purchases it decreased by 10%, you can see here from this slide that we actually purchased 29,000 more books in languages and literature. The exceptions being the German literature, which we purchased 424 less titles, and uh, Far Eastern languages and literature, which we purchased uh, roughly 1,500 less titles. So here we are, uh, once again, we're looking at the combined, um, if you like, winners and losers, uh, linguistics. So in the P saw a 6% increase and uh, the languages and literature overall of our purchases saw a 13.5% increase. And down below you can see and by decrease as a percentage of purchases within P. So uh, the, the, once again the languages and literatures of Eastern Asia we purchased a total of 10,000 more books. Whereas in the, um, let's take a look at the uh, French literature, well, we increased our total purchases by 97% as a total uh, of the languages and literatures LC classification, that decreased 10.8%. So once again, French literature, we bought 97 more titles over those four years and then previous four years but as a percent of our total languages and literature collection, that decreased it by 10.8%. I hope that is clear as mud. Um, let's 
continue on here. Let's see. Ah, so the coming PDA Haboob, or will it be? Since 2010, our selection pool has grown by 92%. We've added uh, all major ebook suppliers at this point. We've added many different formats of, uh, we've added, you know, aside from print and ebooks, we now have film included in that. Uh, expenditures over those four years have seen a growth of over 81% or roughly 20% per a year, year over year. And as we continue to expand formats available for PDA, the question becomes, are we going to start to see our budget blow up more? And for that, I don't, or I don't think we have a, a good answer at this point, but um, we'll keep our fingers crossed and keep you posted. Now, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them. Thank you very much. So it looks like we have one question so far. If you have other questions, please put them in the question box. How did you decide whether to offer print or the e-version? Um, if I could speak to that, after uh, we had, for a while, we had a, um, hold on for one second, we had a policy of e-books, oh, this is Jason, by the way, uh, we had a policy of e-book only. So we would wait until the e-book would come out. And so there was always the preference towards ebooks. We have run out of room. We're not going to be able to expand. And um, uh, that was the thinking behind that. Since then, I would say since around 2012, 2013, we've lightened our stance on that. So that is changing. But what we're finding is um, a lot of our users find the, like the convenience of ebooks overall. But uh, Andrew and uh, Teresa, do you have anything to add to my comments? Sure. I mean, I can just talk about this with Teresa, obviously. <laughs> um, from kind of a running a PDA program point of view, uh, Jason is right that we prefer e over, over, over p. And so um, when we get those files that Jason talked about it, that, that are growing of selection records, we uh, get files weekly. We get several files, and we work with the vendor so that they're going to send us the e version, obviously over the p, and that um, we have a process set up that if the e version comes out um, later, that we find the duplicate of the p version and get rid of it. So that's and it's not exact, it's not perfect, but that's one of the ways that we um, manage um, our preference for e format. So that's kind of from a from a process point of view how that works. And if I could just add one little bit to that, I mean, I think from a user experience perspective, the the e preference makes more sense because it is more seamless. And this is Andrew speaking. It is more seamless to the user, so there's no ordering process. It's just I'm using the book, and because exactly, yeah. because we get. Uh, a certain level of a certain number of unique uses before we even have to purchase it, we still receive a higher return on investment for ebooks than we do for print books. That's correct, and 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 and, and you know another thing that it's not an Amazon experience. Obviously, ordering the print version, it, um, you know, it's got to it's got to be ordered. It's got to then be cataloged and pre-processed and then sent to us, and then it's got a hold's got to be triggered. So it's not. It's not an instantaneous gratification of getting that. It does. It does generally take um, anywhere between seven and ten business days for that to come in for something that's in stock. So that's a consideration too, as Andrew was saying, is that people. It's really instantaneous that they're going to get that access to that ebook. So that's that's another important consideration. So okay, the next question. Did you include ILL request in PDA? And if not, why not? And did ILL request increase between 2011 and 2015? So um, we, so if I'm understanding this, this question correctly, um, are we deflect um, 
IL, so we do not get um, ILL requests for selection records. So that's deflected. They, the uh, people can't can't request something from. Um, they, it's not in our holdings. So we so we didn't see an increase in interlibrary loan. In fact, um, in some ways, um, I mean, I don't know if we've seen it. We haven't necessarily seen a decrease based on that either. Um, but it didn't affect interlibrary loan statistics. Um, from my point of view, I've only been here two and a half years, so I was not here at the startup. But from what I, you know, my understanding in the in the couple of years I've been here, is that um, interlibrary loan has not really been impacted um, by that. Of course, we do. If someone needs a book right away, we do work together. We're part of. We're the same department. So if someone needs something a lot you know, faster, sometimes interlibrary loan is faster than our print PDA, I hate to say, but it's true. So we can, you know, because it doesn't have to go through this, you know, processing, cataloging, receiving kind of work, um, that we sometimes will work together for a user who needs something really rushed, that they, they, they put in a request, but it's not going to be timely enough for them. So does that answer the question, or is there anything follow-up you want me to address about that? If you have a follow-up, um, it, it was in terms. Let's see. It was in terms of the user at A at UAL. One request for an ILL is equal to one request via PDA. Um, the question for borrowing, not lending. Oh, for bar. Oh, so for borrowing. Um, I mean, I, I, yeah. I'm, I mean, so we have selection records, and so. Um, for the ebook selection records, as Andrew and Jason both have said, it's, it's, it's a seamless um, um, access to content. Um, for the print PDA, we have seen there's maybe an impact on ILL for um, you know for you know getting the materials, but for borrowing, um, no, there hasn't been there hasn't been as from my point of view any any impact from the PDA program. Are there hold shelves open to users or behind the desk? They're open to users. So they're out in the open so um, they can pick those up. Um, and then there's also self-checkout. So it, it's pretty, yeah, pretty um, seamless and, and open. And did you analyze the acquisitions with it, without the packages? So that's, I think, a question for Jason. <laughs> that's where we kind of were getting at the print. The we differentiated between the print and the you know, ebook uh, packaging. So those those print ones should reflect buying habits solely through PDA. Jason. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and and actually, um, if we uh, go back, uh, we did examine. You, there is a breakdown. Let me find my slide. Forgive me. Um, you can look at uh, non-PDA. I think it's, let me see here, one, two, four, six. My eighth slide, which is P, language and literature, non-PDA, and PDA. So what we did is we broke it down 2010, 2014, all PDA purchases side by side with non and then you can see the combined purchases. And um, if you look on the next slide, you can see the differences in the titles purchased and percent at a level at the at the uh, language for the P classification languages and literature. Um, we just didn't have enough time or room uh, for, on this presentation to take a look at some of the other. Uh, LC classifications. Is, is the, does that answer your question? I'm going to throw out our, our our last question here. So it sounds like your purchase you purchase books as packages or in the PDA. Do you dedupe the PDA files against the catalog and packages? Are there any other ways to purchase books at this point via traditional subject funds or other kinds of patron requests, for example? And if you want to kind of briefly talk about it and then if it if it turns into something that's longer that we can then send as a as an email later. 
we'll do that. Okay, can, I'll start. This is Jason. I'll start off, and then I'll probably hand it off to Teresa on this one. I'll just talk about um, I, as a selector for business and tech transfer, I can still purchase individual titles. We still get um, uh, uh, purchase requests, and I get those. As a rule, I, I, I haven't turned anyone down yet. Um, because our budget. That might happen in the future, but not in the near term. So, um, and I still will look at uh, titles, but not to add to the collection, but not nearly um, as much time as I used to. Teresa or Andrew? So, as far as, as duplication, um, honestly, we have duplication in our catalog. I'm, I'm not going to <laughs> say otherwise. We try to minimize that by doing things like sending our holdings updates um, regularly to our PDA vendors so that they know not to send us those collection records. Additionally, we have set up um, in our ILS um, particular um, ways in which to load data that will look for match points and will give us error reports, but then we can take a look at more closely to see if that's um, something that we need to address as a, dupl as a duplication. So, but absolutely, we are going to have some um, duplication. We're very, we're, we're especially cognizant of it as it relates to our print PDA program. Um, we, we definitely are trying very hard to cut down on duplication in that. Um, our eBooks were a little more lax on that. Honestly, I think part of that is that it's, they're, they're, they're virtual and, um, and so, and you know, if, if, if there's two or three records, one of them might be a Springer record and one of them might be um, from my iLibrary, which is an electronic PDA, um, it's, it's not the end of the world if somebody it does click on it. Um, you know, and a lot of times they, they may choose the Springer and it may not even trigger a purchase. So we do our best, but it does happen. Great. Thank you, Andrew, Teresa, and Jason for presenting today. Thank you to all of our attendees. We hope you found today's session useful, and we'll, you will soon receive a short online evaluation form. Please take a few minutes to respond to the questions and return the form to us. Your comments are very valuable and help the ELEC's Continuing Education Committee plan new educational offerings. Information about other ELEC's programs can be found at the website listed and suggestions for webinars and other continuing education opportunities are welcome at any time. I would like to thank Joseph Nicholson and Eva Sorrell for providing technical support for today's webinar. The support that um, the technical support subcommittee provide makes it possible for us to present these webinars smoothly. Thank you for joining us this afternoon and we hope you'll participate in other ELEC's continuing education offerings to, again in the future.